For the fourth straight year, HIV infection rates climbed in Canada, a trend that's obviously going in the wrong direction. And while HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is certainly not the death sentence it once was, it remains an urgent and ongoing public health issue. With us for more, and we'll introduce them, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Berks Falls, Ontario, just east of Georgian Bay, there's Laurie Edmiston. She's executive director of CATI, that's Canada's source for HIV and Hep C information. In Port Colborne, Ontario, Trevor Stratton, coordinator with the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. In the west end of the provincial capital, Travis Laneff, He's an HIV AIDS advocate and a member of the pit crew on season one of Canada's Drag Race. And in Scarborough, Ontario, Maureen Owino. She is the director of CAT, C-A-A-T for short, the Committee for Accessible AIDS Treatment. And it's a great pleasure on this significant day on our calendars every year to welcome you all to our program tonight. Laurie, I do want to start with you. As we suggested in the intro, a lot has changed over the past 30 or 40 years as it relates to HIV and AIDS. We all well remember how once upon a time it was a death sentence. Uh, it's not anymore. How far have we come? So we've had tremendous progress. Um, we will talk about where we still have to go. And you, you led off, Steve, by talking about the fact that the numbers are still going up. That's very disconcerting. Um, but 30 years ago, we didn't have treatments. We have life-saving, not only life-saving treatments, but treatments that now, if, if someone is diagnosed soon after they uh, become exposed and starts treatment right away, they can live a full and healthy life, which is tremendous. Travis, you have been quite open about your current HIV-positive status uh, since you appeared on that uh, Canada's Drag Race. And um, I want to know why you think it's so important that you be so open and transparent about your status. Yeah, um, well, for me, it's important because the reason I got such good access to care and help was <clears throat> everyone that was open and, about their HIV status with me personally. So it's kind of a way that I want to pay it forward. And also just, it's so important to have community. There's certain things that you experience, uh, you can only experience as someone with HIV. So it's nice to have someone to look to. So I, I want to give people access to me. How long ago did you resources. find out? I found out uh, two years ago on Halloween. <laughs> How did you find out? Um, I went and did a rapid test at the hassle-free clinic. And then they, I tested positive and they took my blood to confirm and uh, helped connect me to resources as well as, as I said, my friends that were positive helped connect me to resources as well. Well, that's really what I wanted to find out because once you found out, uh, you know, one can imagine there's a sense of, oh my God, what do I do now? Were you able to tap into resources right away and get on, the, get on a good path right away? Fortunately, like, yes. Um, I think at first you just have so much to process. So I didn't like right away take everything that they were uh, throwing at me. Um, but I was lucky uh, to have a lot of friends that were willing to share their status with me and guide me through this experience. So through it, I was able to access everything. But I know that I'm very privileged in that way. And that's not the case for everyone. Well, shall we talk to one of those folks? Trevor, when did you find out about your status? Uh, I tested positive way back in 1990, 30 years ago, and I'm 55 now. Wow. And when you found Seems out in that. 1990, what was your reaction? Well, back then, um, you know, we didn't have antiretroviral treatment. So, you know, getting an uh, HIV diagnosis meant that um, you'd probably live um, okay for a little while and then you get sicker and sicker and eventually you die. So basically it was a death sentence. I felt extremely alone. And just like Travis, I looked for others living with HIV to get information. What's it, all this about? What's it like? How do I, how do I live the rest of my life? Safe to assume that in 1990, you did not think you'd be seeing your 55th birthday? No, they gave me two years to live, actually. I remember that very clearly. And I remember a lot of the drugs back then were so toxic that uh, they were creating side effects and such large doses. Some people would get really sick from the cure, <laughs> or not the cure, the treatment. It's, uh, it's so much different today. I, I, I believe I still have trauma from those days 
you know, those demonstrations of, um, of desperation. It was a very terrifying time for all of us. Hmm. Now, I, I don't, actually, we should, we should establish this. I don't know what your relationship status is right now, but I can, I can imagine how do you deal with the whole issue of whether to tell people about your status as you are trying to embark upon a relationship with someone or explain all that to us, if you would? That's a real tough one. I think um, the best example that I can give is when I took a, a last minute trip to Jamaica. I borrowed some money and went down to Jamaica and I met um, an American woman who fascinated me. We were snorkeling together and eating the great food and exploring. And um, on my last night there in Jamaica, we were camping on the beach. This beautiful woman that I was hanging out with said, hey, uh, you know, I'd really like you to come and sleep in my tent tonight down the beach here. And I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? And and I decided to, to do it, to go and, and sleep with her. But I knew that if things got too passionate, that I would have to disclose it. So it was a, very scary. As it turned out, we hardly slept. We cuddled and, and snuggled and kissed all night. And it was the most romantic memory that I probably have. And eventually she came to see me. I mean, we had a long-term um, relationship after that. She had written her uh, her um, address and, and phone number on a, on a piece of um, napkin that I found crumpled up in my pocket. I phoned her and we started talking and she said, I'm coming to visit you. And that's when I actually uh, disclosed to her on the phone. And I said, uh, you know, I've been diagnosed. I've been living with HIV for two years. And not only that, I haven't been dating women for probably five years. I've been with men only. And she came anyway. And she said, uh, thought, I bet you thought I was going to hang up, didn't you? And that was the beginning of a 10-year relationship. And um, we got married. And through all of it, you know, we wore a condom every time. And she didn't get HIV. Well, we have more tools now, but back then, that's about all we had was uh, was condoms. Safe sex works. Yes. I used to tell that to kids, too. I'd go to schools and tell them that hmm. it works, and I'm living proof of it. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to imagine how, when you disclosed your status to her, I mean, you must have thought that's probably going to be a deal breaker right there, right? Yeah, that's right. And um, I, I really felt it was necessary to disclose, though. And uh, I had I had been developing such strong feelings for her. I didn't want to do anything that would hurt her. And I probably would have a hard time living with it if I had passed it on to her. And we had a, a very strong 10-year relationship. I'd say it's probably the, the most rewarding and, and deepest uh, relationship that I've had in my life. Single now and looking just in case your audience is uh, looking for an <laughs> HIV-positive partner. <laughs> well, we've never really thought of this program as a dating app, but uh, look, at yeah. um, everything's new in 2020, right? <laughs> okay, Maureen, let me uh, thank you for all that, Trevor. That was fascinating. Um, Maureen, let's go on to you now. You have been working predominantly with people with HIV for more than a decade and predominantly with, with immigrants. And uh, let's just start by having you tell us what is it that you do? Uh, I'm the director of the Committee for Accessible AIDS Treatment, which is a coalition of organizations uh, that include uh, aid service organization, community health centers, uh, uh, people living with HIV, as well as legal clinics coming together to reduce service access barriers for people living with HIV who are immigrants, refugees, or undocumented. So we do research, we do community development work, we do uh, advocacy as well as service coordination and capacity building. How significant is the need right now? Uh, yeah, so uh, just listening to Travis and Trevor, uh, as well as Lori talking about treatment having come this far, it's important to acknowledge that, yes, we are very far, 30 years into HIV, there's a lot of treatment, there's a lot of testing options available that's different from what was there before. But it's important to acknowledge that there's also a lot of health disparities for people with uh, from different populations. There's a lot of marginalized people who still cannot access treatment, still cannot access testing, as well as get linked to care. As Travis said, the most important piece is being linked to services after testing. 
But still today, there's a lot of people, including indigenous people, black people, other racialized populations, people who use substances, as well as sex workers who still cannot access the services as well as the treatment. Well, that uh, suggests a logical follow-up with Lori. And I, I know the numbers for the last four years in terms of HIV cases, Lori, are going up, which is very disconcerting. But is it the case in 2020 in Canada that people are still dying of acquired immune deficiency syndrome? Um, yes, unfortunately, it is still the case. And that's primarily people who have not been diagnosed and people who have not been on treatment. So, for example, example, in BC, um, a third or a quarter of people who um, were diagnosed were diagnosed many, many years after they um, had uh, been exposed and, um, and when their, their immune system is already seriously compromised. And that's a healthcare access issue. Issue. It's a stigma and discrimination issue, um, and and uh, and often a, a population issue because some populations in Canada have have uh, greater barriers to accessing treatment and care. There's about ten thousand people in Canada who are undiagnosed, um, and you know, not to use any blaming language, but it's largely people who are undiagnosed who are not on treatment who continue to transmit. HIV. So getting people tested um, is really, really important. Then they can go on treatment and they can live a, a full and healthy life. We should point out that there are governments all over the world, including the Canadian government, that have committed to three essential targets in their efforts to end AIDS in this world. And the targets are they want 90% of people with HIV diagnosed. They want 90% of those diagnosed on treatment. And they want 90% of those on treatment suppressing the virus to undetectable levels. Those are the goals. Uh, Maureen, tell us, how close are we to achieving those goals? <laughs> I laughed because, um, I mean, so achieving those goals is possible. Uh, and uh, uh, as Lori said, uh, challenges is for those who get diagnosed late. Uh, and late diagnosis creates a lot of challenges. The biggest barrier is even getting people tested, and there's been a lot of challenges with testing uh, because of some in some provinces in Canada. There's, uh, for example, in uh, in Halifax, uh, there is on they they do not have anonymous testing. There's a lot of stigma related to testing and finding out your status, and sometimes there's a lot of barriers to people getting this tested. So for that reason, recently we did, uh, if you're aware. Uh, Health Canada approved the first HIV self-test kit in Canada, which is the, uh, which now is going to increase uh, our barrier-free testing. We are hoping that all those people who are living with HIV and are not aware of their status will have access to the testing and be able to access care to get to the 90-90-90. Trevor, I, I think the idea was to reach those goals by now and then to reach eradication of AIDS 10 years from now, by the year 2030. How are we doing, to the best of your knowledge, on that front? Well, if you look at Canada, we are, we're, we've made a lot of progress, but we're, we're really not there yet. And, you know, for there's certain groups like Indigenous peoples and, and um, people who, newcomers from other countries who, who, are overrepresented in, um, you know, people who haven't, who don't know their status, who are not um, taking the treatment or uh, haven't um, received a, um, achieved an undetectable viral load. I think that um, part of the reason could be around criminalization. So some of the activities like um, people, uh, people who use drugs, drug use is criminalized. And um, so that, that causes people to go underground to, um, to be able to service their addictions or their their drug use, and and then people who are um, uh, living with HIV, we can be criminally charged for um, non-disclosure of our HIV um, during uh, a sexual act, even though um, once we achieve achieve an undetectable viral load, that it is uh, scientifically impossible to pass HIV sexually. So I think you know. 
there's there's the thought of um, why why would I get a test if I don't know I have HIV, then I can't get um, I can't get arrested. Huh. So I wonder, I can't help but wonder if that's preventing people from from taking the test, you know, to to take the test and and then face arrest. Travis, as an advocate in this field, I I want to ask you this. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether or not the healthcare system can walk and chew gum at the same time. And by that, I mean, we are utterly focused on COVID-19 right now. I mean, so many of the resources of the healthcare system are being marshaled to try to, you know, stop the spread, find a vaccine, treat the people who've got it, on and on and on. Is it, in your view, the case that HIV AIDS is just kind of getting lost in the shuffle as we all focus on COVID? Uh <clears throat> hundred percent. I think there's a lot of things actually that are kind of just more barriers are getting in the way, even through people reaching out to me on social media. I've had a lot of people needing to navigate, even in Toronto, uh, how to access care or a blood test without a wait because they're trying to find out their levels for a new doctor. So there's just a lot more waiting involved and a lot more barriers. I also heard like people saying like, this was the worst pandemic and it kind of um, isn't fair and isn't true to all the 39 million people with HIV. So yes, I would agree. I would say that we are struggling to walk and chew gum at the same time. Hmm. Now, is it different if you're in Toronto versus the rest of the province? I think it's a hundred percent. I think it's different if you have a doctor who deals with it regularly. I think it's uh, here we have so many options, but as soon as you get to a smaller community, there's so much so much fewer options. Right. How are you going to drive so far? Plan way ahead. Uh, huge lineups, huge wait periods. So it's a lot a lot more work to to being well. And every step of the way that there is uh, a barrier, it makes it harder to to take that responsibility on. Laurie, is there another province or another country that's doing it better than we are and we should look to them as an example? Every province and territory is significantly different. And as, as I think your viewers know, the, um, uh, the provinces and territories are responsible for health care, the delivery of health care. Um, and there are certainly some uh, provinces who have really stepped up more than others um, in relation to COVID, as well as in relation to HIV, as well as in relation to overdoses, for example. So just one example that is relevant to certainly to HIV and people living with HIV is that in Vancouver, um, just last week, the uh, mayor put forward and unanimous, unanimously got support to decriminalize simple possession of, of uh, illegal drugs. That's huge. That will help people not be um, overdosing because of, uh, you know, being tucked away in an alleyway or, or in their in their home and using a loan. Um, there has been a significant increase of overdoses across the country um, during COVID times when we are telling people to stay home, when in fact, if you are uh, using drugs, you should not be using a loan. So that's, that's one example of, of a very progressive uh, policy that um, hopefully the federal government will support and hopefully other municipalities and provinces and territories will follow suit. Trevor, I do want to follow up on your work because you work predominantly with Indigenous communities and Indigenous communities are disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS and I wonder why that would be the case. Well, it's, uh, it's a very historical reasons. There's um, something called multi-generational trauma that is, uh, is, a, is a real thing in people's lives, including in my life. Even though I didn't go to residential school, my grandmother did and many of my family members did. And that's, you know, it, it took away our, um, our ability to pass uh, down the, the indigenous teachings from grandmother to child or from mother to child. And we, we had our own health system. We had our own worldviews. We had ways of, of dealing with trauma and, and disease and holistic health. And, and those things were largely taken away through colonization and um, through the residential school system and, and replaced with a system that was not designed for Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples were not consulted when the Canadian health system was put together. And I dare say that, you know, the 
the immigrants that are coming over, it's a, it's a literally a foreign system that they need to get used to. Hmm. So, you know, that, that adds up, that trauma, and it would explain why, you know, um, the biggest driver for HIV, um, getting HIV for indigenous communities is injection drug use, which speaks directly to, you know, self-medicating and, and dealing with that multi-generational trauma that many of us carry. Okay, so let me go to Maureen next. I, I do remember when AIDS sort of fr first became a, a thing of significance on, you know, in our world, I guess about 35 years ago, we were told that it was so-called intravenous drug abusers, intravenous drug users, we'd say today, uh, Haitians and members of the gay community. And I wonder if you could tell me, uh, Maureen, why uh, to this day, African, Caribbean, black communities uh, also seem to be so disproportionately affected by this. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, uh, and I think I'll go back to, there's a lot of, as I said, inequities and disparities. Black people are still living in HIV pandemic mode. And now this COVID, which his, uh, uh, research has shown that also disproportionately affects black people. Uh, so that includes Caribbeans and, and, and Africans and other black people uh, in Canada. This is mostly because of histories of colonization. Of course, there's the issue of anti-black racism, uh, poverty, determinants of health, the whole spectrum uh, uh, that affects these populations. And more importantly, access to treatment. As much as, and I think going back to Lori's points, uh, healthcare is a provincial mandate. In Ontario, there is, uh, there is no treatment of access, free treatment for HIV people have to buy treatment, either be on disability or have extended insurance or on Trillium. So for those people who fall within the gaps, and I could talk for people who are undocumented or people who are uh, international students, we can talk about um, our, uh, temporary workers, they cannot access a lot of those treatments because they're expensive. And this actually can, uh, becomes a barrier to us getting to those 90-90 goals. So uh, uh, realistically, some of these populations are affected by more inequities, disparities, and a lot of other issues that make them disproportionately impacted by HIV, as well as COVID-19. Well, let me do a follow-up with you. You mentioned international students. Uh, they've been having a tough enough time with COVID, let alone everything else. Uh, what kind of phone calls have you been taking over the last few months on that? There is a lot of phone calls that uh, I've been taking, especially for international uh, and, and specifically for international students who get infected by HIV. And not just over the last few months, over the last few years, we actually undertook a research study to look at the needs of international students who are affected or infected with HIV. And those calls come with accessing treat treatment. And to your other question, with all resources being put into, a lot of resources are being put into COVID. I believe, and I, I actually uh, really am grateful that Ontario HIV services have been uh, responding to HIV uh, in very um, systemic and strategic ways. So there hasn't been so much gaps in terms of access to HIV care, especially in populations that I serve, because a lot of aid service organizations have quickly and innovatively created ways in which they could respond to the, to the HIV pandemic or the HIV issues in our communities. So uh, this, this, the issues are the same prior to COVID and now, because there's been a lot of responses and really very responsive interventions within the sector, within the HIV sector in Ontario. Lori, I want to ask you about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which I gather works like birth control. You take a pill every day and you're 99% protected against contracting HIV. Uh, number one, do we have enough access to it? And if we do, why aren't more people taking it? Uh, excellent question. So um, it's it's a miracle drug. It it works incredibly effectively, and in fact, 
um, what we're seeing in Ontario, and these figures were, were just released yesterday, um, there has been for the first time in at least over 10 years, a decrease in the number of new diagnoses in Ontario among males. Um, there also is, and in the, there's approximately 9,000 males in Ontario that are taking PrEP. And there's a definite correlation there. The, if people are taking PrEP, then their uh, you know, chances of, of getting um, HIV are, are virtually nil. So that's, that's great. Um, unfortunately, it costs a lot of money, as do HIV drugs, and there are... Um, uh, there's restricted, not restricted access, there's poor access um, in much of the country, in particular outside of the big cities. Um, and, and that's partly because of the cost, but it's also partly because of the lack of awareness among people who would be good candidates for PrEP. And those are people who are being exposed to HIV um, and also um, uh, healthcare providers who aren't necessarily up on the um, new science. So both of those things need, need to change. Quick follow-up, Laurie. Is it not on the formulary of the province of Ontario? In other words, uh, if you need it, the Ontario Health Insurance Plan will pay for it. Is that not the case? Um, it is the case, but um, our uh, drug access in this country is very complicated. So there are people who may have dr private drug plans and it may be covered. And then there are people who are on social assistance who can access it through our formularies. Um, then there are people who are in between that who um, would need to access the Trillium drug plan, which is for extraordinary co drug costs, um, and they have to pay a deductible. And it's, it's, not, it's not minor. Um, it's, I believe it's 4% of the household income. So if you, um, you know, are, are living with, with other people, um, it can, it can uh, be pretty expensive, even if you're just covering the, the deductible. And again, it's a matter of knowing that it's around and getting a willing doctor to prescribe because we still do hear about people who are being <coughs> shamed um, and discouraged by their doctors um, to access PrEP. Sure. Travis, I want to say an expression to you and then have you explain what it means. Undetectable equals untransmittable. What does that mean? It means people uh, living with HIV on effective medication, taking them properly, can't pass uh, HIV sexually. And actually, I got to be part of a Katie campaign about it with my ex-partner. And why is it significant to know that? Because uh, that's how typically this passes so this helps to fight the stigma especially like in uh when it comes to bedroom activities and and dating um you know we're reported to by health canada as having hiv so we have that responsibility to have to disclose uh depending where you live i mean the, the rules are all different um but it's a useful uh tool to give people that knowledge to, to help fight the stigma. Now, I don't know how old you are, uh, Travis, but you know, you look like a pretty young guy and you're obviously connected to and a part of Toronto's uh, LGBTQ community. Do you think you get treated differently because of your HIV positive status? Ab absolutely. Um, there's uh, so many more, especially because I'm so public about it, there's so many more questions that I probably wouldn't have to deal with or so many um, times that I have to educate people that I wouldn't have to otherwise. Um, and then also uh, rejection, I guess. But typically when people reject me, I reject them because I, I'm happy to know that uh, I probably don't want to sleep with them if they're kind of ignorant. So, All right, let me finish up on this. We've got a few minutes to go here. And Trevor... Uh, you've now lived through the HIV pandemic, of, which started 35 years or so ago, and now we're into a, a, another massive global pandemic, this one for COVID-19. What have you noticed about how the two were handled, either similarly or differently? Well, you know, when we first started hearing about HIV, I didn't see um, an all-of-government effort to respond to HIV. Um, I, I, I'm really quite amazed that... Um, at the political will to to fight COVID, where I didn't I didn't see that we had to demonstrate we had to flip cars over. There were people sending letters to the to the White House saying throw my 
dead body on the stairs of the of the White House when I die, just to make a statement about about the the lack of care or even the ridicule that existed for um, for people who were contracting HIV. But on on the other hand, I I see similarities too in the sense uh, around the guidelines. You know, I I didn't follow all of the guidelines. I ended up getting HIV, and around COVID, I'm I'm really um, careful about about what I do because of my first experience. I don't want to get COVID. I don't want to pass COVID on. And, you know, I, I see a, um, a lot of people doing the right thing and being very responsible. But I, And I even see some stigma with COVID where, you know, there's some people who I know who got COVID and they don't want to tell anybody that they got it because for some reason they're thinking there's some stigma around it. And there must be. If I mean, that's a, there, there absolutely must be. And, you know, this whole thing about, I'm strong, I don't need to wear a mask, I'm not afraid of COVID. Well, that's those are nice words, but the fact is that um, we're all human beings and we're all susceptible to COVID and HIV. And it's important to listen to the science. And that's where that's that's where we've had successes around um, the HIV response is is to listen to the science. We had conspiracy theories in the early days of HIV too, that it was a government conspiracy that they were trying to wipe out LGBT or or uh, black populations from the face of the earth, you know. And uh, 30 years later, that's not nearly as common anymore. We know what causes HIV and we know how to prevent it. We have all the tools for HIV. I'm not sure we have all the tools yet for COVID. We could end HIV right now. It's a matter of the political will, which I see for COVID, but I really don't see it as much for, for HIV, unfortunately. Well, I think given what we've been discussing for the last half hour, that people who have watched this or listened to it on podcast will be just a heck of a lot smarter going forward about everything everybody can do. And so I want to thank Lori and Trevor and Travis and Maureen for joining us on the agenda tonight. Uh, all the best to all of you, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.